captured in Kabul on 28 August 1995 with four documents and spying instruments. Four, Dawood Jan, son of Ghulam Sarwar Khan, intelligence officer, registered with the Naval Force of Pakistan, captured in Kabul seven days after the Taliban attack on Chara Siab, south of Kabul, 17 October 1995, while gathering sensitive information. Five, Rahmatullah from Kohat, district of Northwest Frontier Province of Pakistan, was captured in Maidan Shar on November 1995, among other mercenaries engaged in fighting against the forces of the Islamic State of Afghanistan. All, Mr. President, are awaiting trial. The Taliban, exemplifying the Pakistani meddling in Afghanistan, are nothing but a creation of Pakistani ISI for purposes other than the return of peace to Afghanistan. In this context, we merely point out later to the statements of a number of prominent Pakistani politicians, senators, members of parliament, analysts, commentators, as well as the Pakistani press. E, violations of Afghanistan airspace by Pakistani planes. This November 30th, 1995, a C-130 airplane departing from Karachi violated the airspace of Afghanistan and landed at Kandahar Airport, bringing weapons and ammunition to the Taliban. Two, December 3rd, 1995, two small UAF airplanes departing from Pakistan's Faisalabad Airport violated the airspace of Afghanistan and landed at Kandahar Airport, again, bringing weapons and ammunition to the Taliban. November 1695, a C-130 aircraft containing military weapons and munition violated the airspace of Afghanistan and landed at Kandahar Airport. The exact point of departure is yet to be identified. Four, November 2695, a Goldstream jet type aircraft with a delegation aboard violated the airspace of Afghanistan and landed at Kandahar Airport. The exact point of departure is yet to be identified. Five, December 3rd, 95, a C-130, as well as two small AC aircrafts, transporting arms and armed production-related equipment, violated the airspace of Afghanistan and landed once again at Kandahar Airport, exact point of departure unidentified. Six, December 5th, 1995, two military transport aircrafts UAF-132 and AC Alpha violated the airspace of Afghanistan and landed at Kandahar Airport. The exact, of point, the exact point of departure is yet to be identified. Moreover, another important piece of evidence should be noted. Recently, the Afghan authorities traced and, the, and discovered evidences of one of the many deals which was worth 27 million US dollar between a Pakistani arm dealer with a defense contractor and one Western European country. And the documents obtained, which contains detailed information about the Pakistani side, emphasizes on a deadline, 10.30 a.m. of November 13, for the budgeting proposal, which is a clear illustration of the fact that there is a government involvement. The deal is to obtain anti-tank weapons, as well as night vision, and some military spare parts, number AM-UAS-12A, obviously for the Taliban. Mr. President, in a series of diplomatic attempts, the Pakistani leadership has been vainly trying to simulate and play innocence with regard to the events in Afghanistan aimed at diminishing the world reaction especially of the region against their irrefutable involvement in the Afghan conflict. Among these are the visit of Mrs. Benazir Bhutto and other Pakistani leaders to some countries of the region. However, the refusal of these countries to accept the explanation of the Pakistan leaders that they are not behind the Taliban foiled the main purpose of these attempts. We express our admiration to the wisdom and sense of realism of these countries. Surely, by taking such a clear stand, 
they have contributed to the cause of peace and stability of the region, besides extending valuable moral support to the Afghan nation and their critical phase of their struggle against the foreign intervention. To secure a responsive international action towards terminating the aggressions and interferences, on September 14, 1995, the government of Afghanistan requested the United Nations Secretary General to dispatch promptly a fact-finding mission to Western Afghanistan to track down the presence of foreign forces and to prove that acts of aggression occurred. Document S-1995-795. The sending of the United Nations fact-finding mission would be highly useful and required even by now to assessment of the evolution of the peace process. Mr. President, before making specific comments about the efforts of the United Nations Special Mission during 1995, I would like to begin by some preliminary observations. Having a glance at the peacemaking activities of the United Nations in other areas of the world, such as Cambodia, Angola, El Salvador, etc., we realize that there is, to some degree, a unified pattern of peacemaking operation that has been carried out step by step. The first step in all these patterns is to distinguish the status of the parties in an internal conflict, namely the government and the insurgent forces. This allows to ascertain their views on a negotiated political settlement in the whole process, Mr. President, the United Nations is to maintain its strict impartiality. It is not advisable to endorse one side or another in a peace process. The United Nations also should avoid premature anointing of any side, owing to the fact that such an endorsement or preferential treatment would impair the trust upon the United Nations as a peace broker. Generally, the continuous contacts and painstaking negotiations with the main actors lead to a formal agreement among the parties, which usually includes two chapters, political and military. The political chapter includes agreements about the structure of power, transfer of power, electoral law, holding of elections, and whenever needed, adoption of a constitution. The military chapter of such an agreement generally deals with the demobilization of irregular forces and building of a national security force. We understand that the United Nations, as an honest broker, and all peacemaking operations develop a practical and pragmatic approach to secure an overall agreement and to supervise its implementation. In all the cases, the most important and urgent matter is the putting into effect of an immediate and durable ceasefire. However, in Afghanistan, it seems that the United Nations Special Mission, in spite of the rich experiences of the United Nations peacemaking activities in the past, and the absence of political agreement and due consideration to imperative elements and factors of a peaceful political process, only emphasizes on one element, namely the transfer of power. This approach may give one the impression that the mission losing the sight of another major element of the stages as on the stages as basic components of the peace process, as prerequisites for a durable, just and credible political settlement. As far as the, state, the Islamic State of Afghanistan is concerned, Mr. President, President Rabbani responded to the continuous insistence by the special mission in asking the President to make his position known with regard to the transfer of power. In receiving Ambassador Mystery on November 3rd, 1995, President Rabbani promised to announce his decision in a gathering to be attended by the members of the Supreme State Council, the Cabinet, prominent religious scholars, leaders of the parties, tribal leaders, intellectuals, and members of independent associations, etc. Accordingly, such a gathering 
was convened in Kabul on November 6, 1995, and which Mr. Abu Nafisa, political advisor of the special missile, also attended. The president announced that he will transfer state power as soon as a mechanism to receive power is established. As a, as a product of an inter-Afghan dialogue with the assistance of the United Nations Special Mission. Furthermore, the President called upon the United Nations to expedite its efforts towards the early establishment of such a, uh, such a mechanism called for by Resolution A-49-140 of 20 December 1994. To facilitate the process, the Islamic State of Afghanistan expressed its initial agreement to a United Nations prepared list of 28 prominent Afghan personalities to form the mechanism for the transfer of state power. To create an atmosphere conducive to the consolidation of political process, Afghanistan initiated new direct talks with the majority of the opposition groups. These talks are producing positive results. Mr. President, here I should like to make it clear that as far as the Islamic State of Afghanistan is concerned, as a matter of principle, no major obstacle towards the transfer of power seems to exist. However, the logical question is whether just obtaining the consent of President on the transfer of power could be a panacea to ensure all conditions needed for the return of peace and stability, as well as the national reconciliation, whether the issue of transfer of power in itself is capable enough to resolve and provide answers to critical issues, such as conditions for a ceasefire, the scope of responsibilities during the term of transition, the duration of the transitional period. Does it secure the assurance for immediate and effective halt to foreign interventions? The problem of prevention and local administrations, the prevention of outside sabotage of the interim authority, the issue of the security force, the collection of arms, the formation of national army, regional and national international guarantees, etc. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, transfer of power should lead to end the conflict. If conflict still proceed after the transfer of power, then what? Achieving a prior overall agreement among the conflicting sides on a comprehensive peace plan would guarantee that an end to the war and the transfer of power complement each other. Mr. President, with the end of Cold War, the United Nations has been engaged in different peacemaking, peacekeeping, and even peace enforcement operations. The valuable experiences acquired in these operations would be useful for any future similar cases. We are of the view that in the case of special missions, guidelines would be necessary beside the United Nations Charter to serve as the code of conduct in this regard. These codified guidelines would further facilitate the implementation of the mandate given by the United Nations to the special missions. These guidelines need to be practical enough to accommodate a global implementation, but also sufficiently flexible in order the specific characteristics of the nations involved in each case to be taken into consideration. Three, some facts about Taliban. Mr. President, simple logic and analysis with regard to the nature of Taliban and their present capabilities leave no doubt as to their linkages to outside. This outside, due to the proximity and interrelationships, ex existence of open border can be no other place but Pakistan. In my statement before the plenary of the 50th General Assembly on October 4, 95, PV 19, I submitted evidences and figures which are the result of objective analysis. On the top of them, the statements by Pakistan high-ranking officials, members of parliament, senators, and statesmen. These statements are denouncing direct financial and military involvement, the training, and even physical assistance of Pakistan to the Taliban. 